everybody! Happy Easter! My name is Crystal. And my name is Rudy. And we wanted to just swing on by or hop like a bunny. Ah. Hop on in and say hi to y'all because service is going to start in a few moments. Just a few minutes. That's right. Are you excited about Easter? I am excited about Easter. What are you excited about? I'm excited about Easter treats. Okay. I'm excited about Easter worship. Yes, it's good. Wait, I don't have my tag. I don't know, but I think we have some Easter jokes. You oh. ready for a couple? Yes, please. I drummed up some of these jokes just for Rudy. So here we go. Rudy, joke number one. It's like a riddle. You have to answer this, okay? Okay. All right, here we go. How many chocolate bunnies can you put in an empty basket? How big is the basket? I don't, I don't know. No, there's no no questions allowed. How many bunnies? Empty empty basket, chocolate bunnies in the basket. Go. How many? The answer is only one, because after that, it's not empty anymore. Great. I don't even it. know if that made any sense. All right, let me it give you one sense. more. Let Wait, me give you one turn. more. My turn. Oh, your turn. My turn. Okay. What does a mommy egg say to a baby egg on Easter? Um, mommy egg, baby egg. You're, your egg's uh, special. Oh, yeah, you are too, Rudy. Extra special. You know what? You're all extra special, and we're going to get into an extra special time of worship right now where we sing songs to Jesus and about Jesus celebrating this weekend the resurrection of our risen Lord and Savior. You guys ready? I'm ready. All right, let's, let's head on over to the stage. See you in a little bit. See you soon. All right, well, hey, everybody. Happy Easter. Hey, and this might be a little old school church for you, but if you got this, um, if I say, he is risen, he is risen indeed, amen. Our God is alive and he is well and he is present with us here today. And we are gonna get ready to enter into a time where we sing some songs to Jesus and about Jesus. But hey, I'm gonna ask you to do something right now that might be a little bit outside of your comfort zone. And it is all in love and compassion for others around us and people coming in. But if you are able, and you are able, to move up a row, in a little bit, let's, we're, it's gonna be a little commotion, okay, throughout the first, you know, five, 10 minutes here today. So if you can move up, forward, in, a little something like that, please do, do it right now. I see you, I see that space in front of you. Come on, thank you, Tom, I appreciate you. So up, in, inside, and actually, we're gonna ask any of our students right now, our middle school, high school, even our youth as well, any students, leaders, and actually anybody, if you wanna come up front, come up in this space up here and join with us, we have this thing we did at camp and we're just continuing it. We're gonna bring some energy, bring our praise, bring our worship. So everybody else, if you are able, stand up, up on your feet as we get ready to sing together. And again, our high school, middle schoolers, leaders, anybody, come on up and let's join in this time of worship together. We are going to remember God on this glorious day. There was a day, maybe today is the day, that he's gonna call your name and you're gonna come running, running home to be with Jesus. Let's sing out, sing out with all we have today and celebrate our risen Lord and Savior. Here we go. Yeah, let's go. I was buried beneath my shame. We could carry that kind of way. It was my too till I made. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures, I tried. To hide, it was my sin. Till I made it. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You call my name, and I ran out of the grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Now I 
Ayong besisin Maso Now you feel to be so That I do The old name do Jesus when I met you Oh what a day When you call my name Out of the darkness into your glorious day, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, To your glorious day, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness, into your glorious day. We're just so thankful. Thankful for your sacrifice. And thank you for a wonderful day like today as we celebrate your resurrection. We're just so blessed. We want to focus on you. And just our whole lives, let's just be pinpointed, laser focused on you, Jesus. Amen. Sing out together. The moon and stars they wept. The morning sun was dead. The savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross. His blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon him.
we sing hallelujah the lamb is over come on sing it out we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah the lamb is overcome and we sing hallelujah we sing completely able if you could look at the seats around you beside you in front of you not behind you don't move back move up and move in please 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 we've got a packed house there are people waiting in the back and we want to make room for friends and people to come in so again if you can quickly quickly let's I know you can look at you you're looking at your friend like we can go we can move we yeah you can let's do it so up and in and you guys in the back come on up come on forward we've got some spaces up front in both the sides and like let's get cozy people this is gonna happen but right now we are inviting up our children's director this is Rebecca Robinson good morning and she has with her Evelyn give Evelyn a big hand well and good morning everyone good morning he is risen so up here with me this morning is Evelyn Helsel. She's a second grader, and she has been in Cross Point Kids since she was a baby. So today, she is going to be reading the scripture for us. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God shows his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. All right, thank you so much. So at this time, middle school and high school are headed out this door. Our Cross Point kids are headed that way. That's kinder through fifth grade. If you're new with us and you want to see where your kids are going, feel free to follow them. And we want to welcome you once again to Cross Point Church, where we are all kinds of people discovering and following Jesus. We believe that God has a purpose and a plan for your life, and we hope that you find out more about that during your time with us today. That's right. And whether you're joining us online or in person, whether you're a regular or you're brand new this weekend, we're so glad to have you here, and we'd love for you to fill out your connection card. Yes. Looks like this if you're visiting us in person. The reason we have you fill those out is just so we can connect with you. We can learn more about you and you can also ask questions about Crosspoint and we'd love to get back to you on that. You can also put your prayer requests mm -hmm. on there yep. and uh, we'd love to pray for you as well. And if you are brand new, go ahead and visit our welcome center that we have yeah. outside in the plaza. We'd love to say hi and love to learn more about who you are and what got you to visit us today. Or if you're online, you can also fill out a QR code 
that will do the same thing and let us know on there. That's your connection card if you're online. Yeah, totally. We would love to just join up, meet up with you, and connect with you. Because, as you may be aware, it is Easter at Cross Point Church, and we're just super excited to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus with you. And we want to thank all of you so much for your continued faithful giving. If you call Cross Point your home and you would like to give, you can simply text the message "Go to Cross Point" to the number seven seven nine seven seven. Real easy ways to give and continue to support all the life and vision and mission and ministries of Cross Point Church. And now it's time for a rapid round of updates. Let's go. Ready? Yep. Third Thursday is coming up. Do you know what Third Thursday is? I Crystal? do know what Third Thursday is. Do you want me to tell you? Tell the nice people what okay. Third Thursday is. Third Thursday is a day of prayer where we gather together at church. Rudy's going to tell you what time and the date, but we can pray for all kinds of things, church related, locally, globally. Just come out and join us for an awesome time of prayer. That's right. Third Thursday is happening Thursday, April 21st, and we will be meeting here at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Yeah, to put pray. up the slide. Tell oh, us when. Okay. There it is. 10 a.m. 2 p.m. It's right there. And guess what else is coming up? I what slide else? for this too. It's the men's barbecue. Oh. Fantastic. I will be not, I will not be there. Men. No, Hit but I bet you wish you were there. Sounds awesome. It is gonna be awesome. What's going on? Well, it's the Ignite Men's Ministry putting on a barbecue, and that's on Sunday, April 24th. Okay at 1 p.m. You can nice. register for that online. There's going to be food, meat, meat food. Meat food, okay, other, cool. Other guys, other dudes. Sweet. Hanging out, playing games. Doing guy stuff. Eating meat. Fantastic. There you go. Sign on up. You can find more information about that on our website, go to crosspoint.com and all kinds of other information and events happening. So hit up our website, but right now grab your programs, grab your Bibles, and we're going to kick it back on over to the stage. Hey, everybody. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. We'll see you next us time. Yep. To, to you. you. Bye. Bye. Hey. There we go. Hey, say hey, and the lights come on just like that. Awesome. So glad that you're here on Easter with all of us here in the Full House. Uh, so, so much uh, that we've got to chat about today. Uh, the big theme of what we're doing over Easter has been looking at great songs that have as their theme, as their text, the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. We've done that for three weeks now. This is the third week, uh, week three of our soundtrack series. There's a note sheet there in your program that you may want to take a look at. Uh, I know this is going to be tricky for some of you because you're going, like, I'm already ADHD already, Steve, and now you have somebody up here painting. Trust me, it's going to get, you think it's good so far? This is crazy what this woman's going to do. When you see what's done here in an hour, uh, I'm just telling you, stay, just stay, it's beautiful, it's amazing. And we're also today, at the end of our time together, baptizing three people, getting baptized today. Somebody asked, like, okay, it's Easter weekend. Should we baptize people on Easter? I said, God may just close our church down. If we don't baptize people on Easter, so it's super exciting. We're going to hear their stories and do some of that today. The big, uh, the title of our message today, the big theme of it here is called Homecoming. And when you think about homecoming or the idea of coming home, what comes to mind for you? Don't shout it out at me, but get your phone out. My phone number is there on the top of the program. Uh, you can all now harass me like crazy at all hours now if you want to. And, and text me when you think about the best parts of home. Now, look, when I talk about homecoming, please don't put down dances and awkward boys that asked me to go to a dance. Or I'm not talking about homecoming like high school homecoming. I'm talking about coming home, the best parts of coming home. And at the end of our time here, on the message part of our time, I want to go through those and I'm going to use that. Anyway, it's just fantastic. It's beautiful. Um, didn't uh, Evelyn do a fantastic job here reading those scriptures today? The most famous verse in the Bible that God loved the world so much that while we were still, well, I'm going to just go look at it. Romans chapter 5. In Romans 5, it, it says that most people would not be willing to die for even a good person. Like, think about it here today. Anybody here in this house that you would actually die for? That you don't know? A good person. Like, obviously, all the dudes are going, yeah, honey, I'd die for you. I swear I would. Yeah. 
But like just somebody here, just a good person here, you like, I don't know you. And he said, although somebody might be like a person who's especially good, which is none of you. (laughs) But God showed, look at verse, uh, chapter five, verse uh, eight. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us when we turned back to him. And we hear that message and think, isn't that awesome? And yet some of you reading your Bibles going, wait, that's not exactly what it says. What we tend to think, what religion will tell you is, you've been bad, and if you get your act together, then God will extend grace and mercy to you. Here's the crazy thing that revolutionizes the world uh, back then and still today when it moves from being just a theological concept to something that you get right in here. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Before we apologized, before we recognized, man, we've made a mess out of things here. God, we're sorry. God moved first and and sent Christ to die for us, to pay the penalty for our sins against him. It's the lyrics to that song. They're there on top of that note sheet that's there as part of your program. It says, Lord, I confess that I've been a criminal. I've stolen your breath and sang my own song. And this is a bit of what religion tells you you have to do. In order to get right with God, you got to say, I'm a pretty good person. I'm pretty good. I've done a lot of good things. But the world we live in, guys, today is a religious world because the whole world is doing this. Today, some of you are gonna do this during the service. You're gonna get your phone out and you're gonna text something amazing about yourself to somebody. And you're gonna sing your own song. Singing your own song, also known as TikTok, Facebook, social media. Look how amazing I am. Or look at all the amazing things that I believe in. And look, am I so amazing that I believe in all these great things and all these great causes, all of that. Uh, And then the next line though moves from the song of the religious and the upright to the rest of us. And Lord, I confess that I'm far from innocent. Not like I'm kind of innocent and I've messed up. I'm far from innocent. These shackles I wear, I brought on my own. I bought on my own. We've made a mess out of our lives. And the culture you live in today is going to tell you, oh, no, you haven't. You're awesome. You're amazing. The reason you have problems in your life is because of somebody else. It was your stupid parents or your current spouse or your ex-spouse or your boss or whatever. They're the reason for the mess. You, you're beautiful. And uh, we have to recognize at some point, Scripture is going to tell us over and over again, um, I'm going to be nice today because you're here on Easter and you're all dressed up and looking great and everything. The message last week kind of just laid into us and just kind of told us, (laughs) We've made the mess, and God, look at this. God came for us before we recognized that we'd made a mess and screwed everything up. And the truth is, for some of us, you can look, I know some of your stories to know that you've been hurt badly by people. You've been horrifyingly sinned against with what's been done to you by evil, wretched, awful people. And yet the crazy thing is, what we sometimes do with that, that shows that there's something just wrong with us, even when we've been sinned against, is instead of turning around, and instead of going, wait a minute, what am I doing here? They talk about this, that that each generation gets progressively worse. So if there was all this jacked up stuff in my grandparents' family, my parents didn't see the stupid, ridiculous thing that was, and then now, it just, it cycles downward if we're not careful. Uh, And the sin done to us and the sin in our world does something to us that destroys us, that, that cuts us off from a perfect relationship with God, a relationship with God that God originally designed you for, with who God made you to be, was to be in perfect relationship, and that no longer exists. And so there's a messed up world that we've got. And uh, there's, uh, back back in the day, 
this is a couple generations ago now, in the midst of poverty, in the midst of war, in the midst of injustice, in the midst of just, it was terrible. Uh, kind of like how things are today, a little bit, depending where you live. But uh, a leading publication asked some famous authors and famous celebrities to respond to this question. And the question was this, what's wrong with the world today? And all these theologians, philosophers, professors, celebrities, all wrote back in and they published a series of articles that came in and had you know, long column after column looking at philosophical, theological, all this stuff that was going on in the world. A famous author of that day, his name is G.K. Chesterton, when he got, they asked him to respond to it. And in answer to that question, what's wrong with the world today, he simply wrote this back. Dear sirs, I am. Sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. To say, look, the problem we have in the world stares us back in the mirror every day, and we have to stop blame shifting. If we keep blame shifting, we're never going to get recognized. Look, I've got a problem. I can't keep blaming everybody else for what's going on out there. Over in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells a famous story about this. It's referenced here in the lyrics to this song. So if you got a Bible or a mobile device with a Bible on it, and the internet is free here, <laughs> why don't we make you log in and give us your, you know, you give us your background stuff so we can track you and stalk you and all that stuff. But it's Luke 15. It's famously known as the story of the prodigal son. In fact, your, a lot of your Bibles will have little paragraph headings here, and we'll tell you what's coming next. Yours all say the, what, the prodigal son. Mine says the parable of the lost son. Can I tell you right now, that's not what this story is about. I'll prove it to you. Look how it starts. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them a story. A man had, how many? Two sons. It's the story of the prodigal sons. And for those of you that grew up going to church like I did and heard this story, I've honestly probably heard it 150 times at least. I've seen some different things in here in the last couple of years especially, and especially this week heading up into Easter, that I hope are encouraging and helpful, maybe even convicting to your soul and your spirit today. It says here, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now, before you die. In other words, dad, I wish you were dead now so I could get my money, but since you're not dead, give me my money. Now, how many of you that have any kind of money at all, your kid comes to you, what's going to happen next? <laughs> he might pick himself off of the floor. I know that's not cool and legitimate and whatever, but before you die. So his father agreed. And all of a sudden, if you're hearing the story back in the first century, especially, you're going, well, that's different. His father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land called Las Vegas, or wine country. <laughs> and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his field to feed the pigs. Now, you and I hear that and think, okay, he's taking care of pigs at the pig farm. Anybody in here Jewish by, by ethnicity, by culture, by religion? Probably one or two of us in here. What do Jewish people tend to think about pigs? They're dirty, filthy. Like some of you today are going to have pig for lunch. You're going to have ham, right? Oh, but it's honey-baked ham. Ooh. <laughs> to a Jewish person in the first century, and even to... Orthodox cultural Jews that still abide by the kosher laws and all that, that's the equivalent of saying, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go out there, we put a trap out, we caught a big rat, we're going to honey baste it and roast it and have rat for dinner today. Like, sick. That's how Jewish people thought about it. I'm not telling you that's what your ham is, so relax. I'm not condemning you for your ham, whatever. He's there with the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. You ever been at a place in your life, and maybe you know somebody's been at a place in their life, where they thought, how in the world did I get here? How in the world was I wealthy beyond imagination, living at my father's house, everything taken care of? 
and the slop they feed pigs looks good to me, and they won't let me have any. What happened to me? What happened? This next line in your own Bibles, or if you have one of our Bibles and you have your own pen or pencil, or the highlight version on your mobile device, I love this line, when he finally came to his senses. Some of you need to come to your senses in all kinds of ways. But maybe you're here on Easter and for the first time, spiritually, God's going to get a hold of your heart. You're going to come to your senses. He said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, <clears throat> and this is, the, those of you who've ever messed up at work or messed up, you know, kids, some of you remember back when you were 15, 16, 17, when you really jacked something up bad, when you made a mess out of something really, really bad, and you had to go back and talk to your parents about it, you rehearsed the whole speech out? Yeah, me too. Father, Father, I have sinned against both, and he puts the uh, religious stuff in here, heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy Underline, highlight that stuff. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. What he thinks he's going to do is, I'm no longer, dad will never take me back as his son, but man, the servants in the house, the employees in the house, at least they have plenty of food and a place to stay. So maybe I can come back there and have my basic needs taken care of. And maybe someday, maybe in the back of his mind, he thinks, maybe someday, Maybe someday I'll be able to earn my way back into a good relationship with my dad. But for right now, I just got to go home and be one of the employees uh, on the farm. So, verse 20, he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Now, again, picture the scene here now. Again, it's a film. All of a sudden, the father sees way out there on the road some little dot of something walking dusty down the road, and Father's sitting out on his porch. And all of a sudden, the music all of a sudden goes, Ooh, and swells up. And you go, something's about to happen here. Father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. And what you need to know too about this, because we don't get this because as men today, most of us wear pants or shorts. Very, very few of us wear kilts or robes. Few of you do that, when you, whatever. But back in that culture, back in that culture, a Jewish man, especially a Jewish man who was well off and had status and had the robes on, would never run anywhere. Because in order to run, you had to pick up your robes, and now you're like exposing your nasty white legs to the whole world and all that stuff. So he, but he is so moved with emotion because it's his boy and his boy is coming back here. Do we know anything about what the boy is going to say to his dad yet? Well, we know, but does the dad know? All he cares is, that's my son and I'm going to get him. And so he runs down there, embarrassing himself in front of all the employees, all the servants of this big estate farm that he's on. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, okay, Father, and he, here's the speech. I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. G compare that verse, verse 21, with verse 19. What's missing there? He doesn't get through the whole speech. You know why? I think his dad just goes, but his father said to the servants, quick! Bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. And so this is exciting. It's a beautiful story. And some of us need to know that that's been our story a bit. We find ourselves from time to time in our life, or you'll know people from time to time in your life that are dead in their sin. They're hopeless. They've given up all hope of anything ever being restored with them and God. They go, I have gone too far. And we're here on Easter Sunday 
morning to tell you, you think that's hopeless. The creator of the universe who took on a human body named Jesus, who lived 33 years, is laying dead in a tomb, and it's over. But if the tomb is empty, anything is possible. Anything is possible for you, for people you know, and I know you're thinking, oh, I don't know about me, or I don't know about him or her. I'm telling you, anything is possible. So this, this, this big, beautiful story. And, t- and typically, when we have told this story in church, when we've sung about it in songs, it's all about the prodigal son. And it's all getting like the music swells up, and the father is just kissing his son. He's so happy, excited, and there's feasting and party, and it's awesome, and it's beautiful, and restoration has happened, and then, and then the credits, closing credits roll and fade to black, and we're all going to go home. And it's, uh, but that's not what happens here. In Jewish, well, not Jewish literature, any literature of any kind, you have, uh, those of you that paid attention in your English classes, both of you, um, <laughs> You have the narrative arc of a story. You have all the kind of the action here, the characters and the rising action. And then it gets to a point where it's like the pinnacle part of the story. And then there's what they call the closing action. It just, and it quickly ends. But you know that Jesus tells them the third of the story about the other prodigal son in the story. One who often doesn't get noticed or talked about a lot. Meanwhile, The older son was in the fields working. Hmm. He's been the obedient son. He's done the right things. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother's back, he was told, and your father's killed the fattened calf. We're celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and would not go in. His father, those next two words in your own Bible, with a pen or pencil or something there, his father came out. Do you see what happened up there in verse 20? When the father saw his son, what did he do? He left the house and he went out to go get his prodigal son. The father now sees his son who was not in the house and he runs out to go get him too. He begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. Anybody in here like that today that feels like I've been a pretty good person? Don't raise your hands because that'll be embarrassing for you. (laughs) I've been a good person pretty much my whole life. Okay, I did some things. I wasn't perfect, but come on, I wasn't. I didn't go to Vegas and prostitutes and meth and drugs. I didn't do that. I'm a pretty good person. I've done everything right. I've been pretty compliant, done everything right that I'm supposed to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet, when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf? His father said to him, look, dear son, you've always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost but now he's found. What he's talking about is the lyrics of the song. It's his homecoming. When the son comes home like this, we have to celebrate. And I find it fascinating in here in the story that there are two prodigal sons. The one that we always talk about, the rebellious prodigal, but the second one here in the story is the religious prodigal, the spiritual prodigal, the one who was raised in church his whole life. The one who pretty much did everything right, never gave his parents too much trouble, too much bits. Whatever you told me to do, I just did what you told me to do, Dad. And in here in the song, you see what he's doing here? The the first couple lyrics of Homecoming says, I stole your breath, I sang my own song. He's talking about how awesome he is. And that he's earned the right to be his father's son. Where the first son, the rebellious son, said, I'm not worthy. You know what this son is saying? I am worthy. Look at everything I did to earn your favor. favor. And I think the, the father in here in the subtext of the story and what our God would say to us is this is an analogy for how our relationship with him works is 
You don't earn your way into being my child. You're not a child because you obey me or because you disobey. You're a child. Don't miss this because I'm your father. That's where being a son or a daughter of God comes into play. And the irony of the story, do you see it here? Remember the rebellious kid who jacked the whole, made a mess out of life, made a mess out of everything, took all the father's money and went out and squandered it? What's he doing at the end of the story? He's dancing and eating and he's face to face with his father, having a blast out there with it. He's come home. What's the good kid, the spiritual prodigal doing? outside the house, and his face is not toward his father. His face is separated from his father. And that's why Jesus tells this story. Because he's trying to get the religious good people of his day to go, look, I've come here for everybody. For the rebellious and, don't miss this, I've come here for the religious, for you good folks too. See, growing up, and then even in my life as being a pastor for all these years and stuff like that, I've often heard this story like this. God loves the prodigal, the rebellious prodigals, the ones who make a mess. He loves them. Me, on the other hand, the good kid who's like, whatever, he's kind of like just, eh, whatever about us. He doesn't have much time for us. In fact, we kind of annoy him because we're just so meh. And do you see what happens in the story? The father goes outside and it says, he came out and he begged him, come inside, come inside, you're my son. The rebellious one is my son. The religious one, you're all my sons. Maybe you're here today. I don't know where you find yourself on that spectrum. We have some of you here today that go, look, I'm the, prod- I'm the rebellious prodigal, or at least I was, and my whole deal is I'm not worthy, and you don't have to talk me into that. I know I am not worthy. Some of you are here today, and you're more like the religious, spiritual prodigal. You're saying, I am worthy. And then my guess is it's a bunch of you hybrid folks here in the middle. <laughs> kind of a bit, a bit of both of that in your life that's kind of woven like a fabric, a tapestry in your life. When you tell God either I'm, I'm not worthy or I am worthy, you know what he's going to tell you? Shh. No, you're not. To the son who says, I'm not worthy, no, you're not. To the son who says, I am worthy, no, you're not. But he is. But God's worthy. He's the one that has established home for you to be in, in a relationship with God. We did not get our act together to make ourselves children of God. God did that for us. And the the chorus of the song that's there on your note sheet Uh, We're going to sing this song in a bit, and I want to encourage you to sing it when we sing it. It says this, these scarlet sins had a crimson cost. You nailed my debt to that old rugged cross. We talked a lot about that last week. I'm not going to go into all the details of that, but your sin, the mess you made of your life, either, look at me for a second, either in rebellion over here or in self-righteous pride and religion over here, All that stuff had a crimson cost to it, and it was nailed to the cross of Jesus. You can't pay the penalty on your own. It's impossible for you to pay that. That's why the Father says, come inside here. I've taken care of everything. And then I love the the next lines here. It says, an empty slate at the empty grave. Thank God that stone was rolled away. If we celebrate here on Easter, that when Jesus died on the cross, that wasn't the end of it. Certainly that was an important part of it because in order to have a resurrection, you have to have a crucifixion. You have to have a death. So Jesus is laying there dead in the grave. And there's, I'm not sure what the word empty slate means here. I think there's two, two different things. One of them could be just the empty slate of stone they laid him on in the tomb. And the, there, there's a slate there where his dead body was laying there on Friday. On Sunday morning, the stone was rolled away, not to let Jesus out, to let us in to see that he is gone, he is alive, he is no longer what we thought was dead and over. He's resurrected, he's risen, uh, all that and more. That could be what it means, but I think there's more to it than that. 
I think when it says an empty slate, this is why it's beautiful lyrics by the authors of this song. An empty slate could have to do with this simple idea of this. Every single one of us has a slate of charges against us. In fact, when you go into a courtroom or something like that, they often call it your slate or your record. It's all the stuff when you go in there. And now some of you, you know, when it comes to a legal court here, and it wouldn't be much there for you. But against God, man, that record, every thing you've done, every evil thought you've done, and look at me for a second, and all the good that you haven't done, not just the bad stuff that you have, but the good that you were supposed to do that you didn't do, is listed there, and it's a long slate of a record, and it's ugly and nasty. It's a little bit too like maybe like a financial thing, like before God I have this debt that I can't pay, my, my, my uh, FICA score, FICA, whatever it is, is, is negative that I'm not, I'm, I'm not just zero balance. I am in the hole to the point where there's no possible way for between me and God to square that away. And that's why he says, thank God the stone was rolled away. Because what he's going to tell us here is that on that empty grave, that empty, when, when Jesus died and rose again, you know what happened to your record? That slate you had? Wiped away clean. It's done. But I'm going to tell you there's better news for that, better news than that here today. Because it's not just the fact, look at me, don't miss this, that you have an empty slate. The scripture is going to tell us very, very clear. Let me put some context to this. Some of us think this. With my life, that slate of charges against me, when I became a Christian, or if I'm considering becoming a Christian today, what God will do is he gets like the magic erase thing out and just wipes it all away and it's blank. And then he says, okay, get to work. And now you put your good stuff on your record. It's a little bit like, see what Katie's, oh my gosh. In an hour, <laughs> it's crazy. And stay tuned, there's more stuff coming. It's beautiful, amazing. Anybody here ever tried to paint that's not a painter? <laughs> Anybody ever tried to paint something and thought you were a painter and found out quickly, no, it's not so fast. <laughs> Maybe when you're little kids, you know, you have the, the, the thing, the canvas, and you make it and you go, oh, whatever. And we think, well, what God did on Easter was he took the canvas and he scraped all this stuff off, and he just put a, 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 a coat of white or red or blue paint or black paint on it. And we go, okay, now it's empty now. So here's a brush. Go. What the scripture tells us? Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says this. It's not by your good works that you're saved. It's according to his righteousness and his grace and his mercy. He says we are God's masterpiece. So look at me for a second. Man, you... Your ability to be a good Christian before you were a Christian was impossible. And your ability to be a good Christian on your own after you're a Christian is impossible for you. The only chance you have is that 2,000 years ago, the Son of God who was dead, hopeless, finished and done, resurrected from the grave, and the Bible is going to tell us that the same power that raised Jesus from the grave is now alive in you as his follower, and now what's happened is what the theologians, the philosophers, the, the guys who are smarter than I am, call this the great exchange, or it's also called the doctrine, you'll see it in some of the older school Bibles, the doctrine of justification. It's this. You do not have an empty slate. What's on your slate today is the record of Jesus Christ. And that's why it's very important that Jesus, this is a bit of theology here today on Easter. So think for a little bit with me. People sometimes ask, well, why couldn't Jesus just come down? If he had to die, so he just comes down and dies and rises from the grave. The reason he had to be here as a human being, he has to live as your substitute and my substitute, as a real human being. But because he's fully God, and fully man, what that means is his record can now be infinitely applied to every one of your lives. When God sees you today, despite what your week or your morning looked like, if you have surrendered your life to Christ, he sees his perfect son's record there. In your, when he goes to your file and go, let's go see what's in Jack's file. Let's go see what's in... Uh, Rebecca's file. Let's go see what's in Dwayne's file or Tim's file. Let's go, let's go look and see what's in their file. You know what he sees? You think, oh man, I know what I did this. I wonder what's in there. You know what's in there? The perfect record of Jesus is in there because of the resurrection. He came out of that grave with real power. And then what he tells us to do, 
He says, look, there's some work we got to do here because you're a mess, dude. He says, but give me the brush. And, and the, the, the life of discovering and following Jesus is not discovering and following yourself and trying to figure it out for yourself. It's simply, I keep my eyes on Jesus, and I take my, did Carrie Underwood take your hands off the wheel? Jesus, take the wheel. Let Jesus drive your life. You give Jesus the paintbrush and say, here, go crazy here. And he offers that option to all of us today. It's the, the beautiful story in the most famous verse in the whole Bible. John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him, and you know whoever means? Whoever. That means the rebellious people over here and the religious people over here. And don't miss this for a second. You know who had the hardest time with Jesus? Not the rebellious people. They knew they needed Jesus. You know who had the hardest time with Jesus? The religious folks who thought, oh, I'm a pretty good person. Jesus says, no, you've got to get right with me too. Whoever believes in me will not perish but have everlasting life. And some of you in your heart are still thinking, well, what does that mean? How do, I, how do I get this life? The Bible just tells us it's simply by faith. It's simply just by believing in my heart, confessing in my heart that Jesus is God, that I know I'm a sinner, I need a Savior, and I'm surrendering my life to him today. So I'm going to take a moment here on Easter to ask you right now to close your eyes if you want to, bow your heads. Just take a moment here just to, to, for you and God to take some time And simply say yes to Jesus. And I'm going to pray a prayer that you can kind of repeat along with me. Let it be the expression of your heart. Lord, I confess that I have been a prodigal and rebellious or I've been self-righteous and thought I was okay because of my good deeds and both things are wrong. I just... I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And I believe that what you did on that cross and in your resurrection 2,000 years ago counts for me today. And in faith, I surrender. Amen. If that's you today, on the connection card they had you fill out a couple minutes ago, do me a favor and tell us about that. I want to get some stuff out to you and talk about what this new relationship with God looks like. And then I asked you a few minutes ago to text me. Let's see if any, how many of you guys did that. The best parts of my home are my husband, Eric, and our sons, Cannon and Kaysen. We know who you are. <laughs> God, lots of them here. What, uh, warm blankets, food. Oh, I love this by Hannah. The only place where you can actually rest. Somebody wrote down, my puppy greeting me. <laughs> Warm blankets and food, homecoming, uh, seeing the ones we love and building memories, enjoying mom's cooking and dad's wisdom. Uh, the best parts of coming home, the, the comfort of familiarity. I just feel like, I, oh, this is so good. Yeah. Uh, the, the love and good times, <laughs> Mike Tapley, my tennis racket. <laughs> <laughs> Hugs from my family, my comfy bed, uh, the feeling of being completely relaxed and accepted. Uh, somebody wrote down a hug from my mom. Hmm. Somebody, this is, Rochelle wrote this, but some of you who are our military friends, part of our across my family here, you've seen those videos, right? When Dad's been gone for six months, a year, whatever, and then they surprise the child in the classroom or at the game. I'm telling you, you if you're not crying at that place, you need to repent. <laughs> it's so beautiful and so amazing to watch. This is the whole idea of homecoming. And the idea of homecoming is this idea of coming home. It's like oh, the best parts of it. The best parts of it is that I've arrived. I'm here everything else is gone away, all the crazy stuff of the world and the culture and all that here, I'm home. 
And the world you and I live in is trying to tell you this. It's trying to tell you, you can come home without getting back to God. This, trust me, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, you know what the biggest sellers they have there? Self-help books. All designed to help you become a better version of you. And the whole point of it is like, well, if you just do this and just do this, then you'll get whew, the life you always wanted. And it's beautiful and amazing and fantastic. And then all the advertising, every single bit of it is trying to tell you, if you just get this, then you'll be home. And whether it's the latest one of these, whether it's a home, whether it's a relationship where you thought, man, if I could just find him or her, or you're married, you want to have kids, and I could have children, all that and more. If I could, ju- if I could just, if I could just get there, and we will spend our lives, this is what every human being does, trying to find home without going home to God, is we're out there and we're chasing it. And, and some of you know this, know this, right? You will know that the, the chase, and you go, I'm chasing it, I read the books, I work hard, and I just about get there, and it's always just beyond my reach. And it's what Ecclesiastes talks about. We just keep searching and looking, trying to get there, trying to get there. And once in a while, look at me for a second. Here's what happens. Once in a while, you grab it and go, oh. And you feel it, right? It feels so good. And it's awesome and amazing. And for a couple fleeting moments or days, this is awesome. This is amazing. And then it's not there anymore. And you know what you start doing? Keep chasing And I got to work harder and faster to get more, to go, go, go. And then I want to tell you too, sometimes what happens for a few of us here, uh, some of us here in the house, uh, people that are fabulously wealthy and powerful, they have told us, look, I have, my life has exceeded my wildest dreams. Beyond anything you can grasp or comprehend, I cannot believe how I live, where I live, my, the quality of my relationships, the pleasure and power, everything I feel, and yet they will echo exactly what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes. He says, I got everything the world had to offer, and it was all so empty and meaningless, like chasing the wind. Jim Carrey, famous actor, comedian, uh, said it a couple of years ago. He said, I wish everybody could get as rich and famous and powerful as I am and discover that it's just empty that it will not ever make you feel like your home. And C.S. Lewis, a famous Christian author years ago, said it this way. If you find yourself here in this world with desires that cannot be met in this world, perhaps you were made for another place. That this is not your ultimate home and destiny. This is what the resurrection of Jesus on Easter teaches us. That Jesus rose from the dead and Jesus is here by his spirit here. But you know where Jesus went? To home. Hey, guys, I want to tell you here too. Because some of you are going to hear, well, I should come home. My relationship with God, if I become a Christian, you're telling me I will feel like awesome and amazing. And you will feel awesome and amazing. But anybody here as a Christian not had an awesome, amazing week? Yeah? Me too. There's all kinds of stuff that happens where you don't feel, so I don't want to give you this nonsense that just become a Christian and you will be one with the universe and the cosmos and all that. I'm just telling you it's not true. The one of the great bands of all time wrote about it back in their Joshua Tree album. It says, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And this is a song of faith of like, I believe it's true and I've committed my life to it, but I, you can chase it and chase it. You're never going to get there. Jesus says, come home, and he says, even in this life, know that you'll have the meaning and purpose to live in a life that's, that's, that's weird and sideways all the time, and at times you'll feel happy, and at times you'll feel sad, and sometimes you hear the visit of the doctor, it doesn't go so well, whatever those things are, you can come back home to your father and know that this ultimately right here, right now, is not home for you. There is a home coming. And in, again, C.S. Lewis, who wrote some famous Christian books called The Chronicles of Narnia, that every, and they're written as children's books, 
Um, every adult should read them at least four times in your life, at least. But the last book is called The Last Battle, and in The Last Battle, it has this beautiful scene where the children are, they don't quite know it yet, dead, and Aslan, the Jesus character in the story, tells them, haven't you guessed it? And it says, and then they began to experience things that they had no idea about, and they began to discover that all their days in the previous to that, from all their existence in here, they call them the Shadowlands, were just the introduction and the forward. And the real story was now beginning, in which we all indeed, as followers of Christ, will live happily ever after. And don't miss this, because some of us think heaven is like, isn't it going to be boring for billions and billions of years? Oh no, every chapter is better than the one before. It's the lyrics to the song. Heaven joins in with a glorious sound, and the great cloud of witnesses all gather round, because the ones that were lost are finally found. Your Father is welcoming. This is your homecoming. So today here at Crosspoint, as the band comes up, religious or rebellious, what we're telling, what God tells you is just stop. Get in here. Your Father is waiting to welcome you in with open arms to say, come home. Come back to me. We're going to sing some songs about that. Katie is going to finish this painting here, and stay tuned. It just gets better and better and better. Um, ordinarily here at Cross Point 2, every weekend we give you the opportunity to come and receive communion. We're not doing that today because communion celebrates the death of Christ. We're not celebrating the death of Christ today. We're celebrating the fact that 2,000 years ago he came out of the tomb, and he's alive and kicking today. So we're going to celebrate that today. Now, sometimes people here at Cross Point um, have, you, want, you want to pray with somebody about something. Some of you are like, okay, that decision to become a Christian and pray that prayer, I want to talk to somebody about that. In the back of the house right back there by the brown doors back there in the, in the back is our prayer team. And if you have questions about anything where you wonder about something or wonder, I, I got problems in my life or questions about some of this, go back there and let them pray with you and pray for you. Now, people all the time, so I'm seeing some of you going like this right now. You know what they call it here? We call it cross point cold. We keep you cold on purpose. You know why? So you'll warm the place up a little bit by being excited about the fact that Jesus, be, be at least, be, at, be as half as excited. And this is for the dudes out there. Because I see these dudes out here sitting here going, oh, whatever. Be as half as excited about Jesus rising from the dead as you are watching grown men in tight pants chase a ball around the field. <laughs> he rose from the dead and he's alive. And he's in my life and he's got a masterpiece that he's painting in my life, and when I was dead and hopeless, when my life was dead and hopeless, in my rebellion or in my religion, while I was a still sinner, Christ came and he died for us and he rose again. So Jesus, we sing today. We celebrate you today for everything you are, everything you have done. God, we confess that we are criminals. We've sang our own songs. We're prodigals. We've walked our own roads. We're just coming home right now, right here, today.
alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are sealed, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I'll sing. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in him. This gift, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was made. By darkness sweet then bursting forth in glorious day, but from the grief he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me. She's Oh, the ground is sinking sand. 
one more song today to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, to celebrate our ability to come home to God because of what Jesus has done on the cross and then that he rose victoriously. If you are able, we would invite you to stand with us as we sing this last song together, just declaring that God not only has opened a way to get us home, but he's here, he's calling us. We just pray that you've heard his voice today and we can respond now too to him out of love with our own voices. Let's tear the roof off this place, guys. Let's celebrate what God has done for us. Lord, I confess that I've been a criminal. I've stolen your bread. Sing my own song. And Lord, I confess I'm far from innocent. The shackles I wear I'm born on my own. Scarlet sins at a crimson cost. You nail my dead to that old rugged cross. An empty sleigh at the empty grave. Thank God that stone was rolled away. And Lord, I confess. I be the prodigal to lead for your house and walk my own roads. Then Jesus came and tore down my prison road. And death came to life. Bright crimson robes draped over the ashes, a wide open tomb where there should be a casket. The children are singing and dancing and laughing. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Roses in bloom, pushed up from the embers. Rivers of tears flow from good times remember. Families are singing and dancing and laughing. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Heaven joins in with the glorious sound. And the great cloud of witnesses all gather round. Cause the ones that were lost are finally found. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming.
Hey, go ahead and take a seat real quick. We have people getting baptized. Our hosts are going to come through right now and pass some buckets through to get those connection cards from you. And also, if you are giving to support the church and have that with you today, you can drop that offering in there. Uh, this painting is going to come back out at the end of the service so you can get pictures of it and all that. We do have to move it because people are getting baptized today. Katie Perryman, wow, amazing, thank you. <laughs> Baptism is a symbol of Jesus. That just as Jesus died and was buried and rose again, we are united with him. When you become a Christian, your old life dies and is buried and you come up out of that water that's symbolizing the new life, the miracle life that God has for you. Uh, here in the water right now is Haley with Dwayne and Kim. This is, this is a beautiful story, guys, and we don't have time. We'd be here till three o'clock today to tell all of these stories, but this is beautiful. Haley said, growing up, I always knew about Jesus. When I was young, I went to church with my dad, but never really showed interest in it because I thought it was somewhat boring. As the years went by, I started to lose faith because I've never grown up in a stable environment, nor had any hope. Through all the abuse, bullying, and neglect from the woman I thought was my mom, I thought I wasn't good enough and decided to give up. And just so we're real clear here, Dwayne and Kim are not her biological mom and dad. Uh, there's foster adopt. Uh, there's a, a big story behind that. Um, I always thought that when bad things happened, God or Jesus was never there. The truth is, is that if I lived through an attempted suicide and all of that, then Jesus was with me the whole time. Every so often, I would always wonder how I was still alive, but now I know there's a reason. Getting baptized will mean a lot to me today because I don't want to be the angry same person I once was, but instead become the person Jesus wants me to be, more caring, more loving. So from this moment on, I decide to follow Jesus no matter what because he's never given up on me. And a huge thank you to the Leg family for always caring, loving, and the best one of all, believing in me. With the new hope, love, and foundation that they and God have given me, I now have a new reason to live and to succeed in life. I don't know where I would be or if I would still be here if I didn't find them when I did. Thank you. I love you, Kim and Dwayne. And they're going to baptize this girl now. And Kira is now getting in the water. Yeah. <laughs> With her mom and dad, Rob and Jenna. Here's Kira's story. In 2017, me and my family went through one of the hardest things we could go through. We were separated from my brother so he could get some help with some of the tough things he was going through. Our family was separated for a year with limited visits. Through the year, we were extremely lonely without him and it pained me to see how sad my family was without him. After a year, he came home and now that I look back, I was so thankful to have him with us again. I realized this was a gift straight from the glorious hands of God. Now that I look back, I can see how God puts each and every one of us through these hardships to make your relationship stronger with him. And that experience was a huge learning lesson for me, which taught me to not fear the future because I'm in the hands of God. I continue to go through my life with the hardships of life every day. 
But I know no matter what happens, the Lord, my God, is by my side wherever I go. So today, I'm ready to get baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So I can announce that Jesus has my heart and soul for the rest of my days. And I can now officially call myself a follower of Jesus Christ. Woohoo, she says. I love you all. baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We got one more, Elliot. Elliot Perry is getting the water. Yeah. He's getting the water with his mom and dad, Crystal. And Evan, uh, as you guys are seeing people get baptized today, I've talked to some of you out there, both women and some men, who go, well, I don't know about getting baptized in front of all those people. Look, 13-year-old kids got in that water today in front of all you. Come on. If you're not ready, come on, let's go. But Elliot's story is, is fantastic. He says this, my journey of being a Christian started on a day before school when my dad and I were sitting at the table during breakfast. On that day, I accepted God into my heart. My dad was overjoyed and surprised, to say the least. He wasn't expecting to see such a cool moment before he dropped me off at school. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And my motivation for being baptized is that I want to be faithful to God. I want to go to heaven. and I want to follow Jesus. I thought about getting baptized many times before, but I didn't have much of a reason to do so until now. I want to pray often read the Bible very often to be someone that people know has God in their heart. Through the darkest times of my life, I will stick with God until the day I die, no matter what. So a couple questions. Elliot, have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. And are you committing your life to following him no matter what? Yes. It's our honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go! Woo! All right. As we get ready to go now, today, you can stand up. We're going to let our kids kind of make their way out a little bit so there's not just crazy mayhem and kids getting trampled here and everything. Hey, there are people here at Crosspoint here today on Easter Sunday that you don't know yet. Some of them, it's their first time at church in a while. Some of you just don't know them because you don't know them. So meet somebody today. Look at me. Meet somebody today that you don't know. And then come up here. We're going to get the uh, easel back out and the picture back out. You get some pictures and stuff of all that. Thank you for being here. Happy Easter. Go. We're done. We're done.